We've had a wonderful Sunday morning, a time of worship and fellowship with God to know that he is gathered with us in these moments as we sing these songs of praise. And we, we are so thankful for the young men who have come together for the leadership initiative. I know they, they keep saying thank you to the congregation here, but I would say as the congregation on behalf of the elders and the deacons and all the members here, we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy summers and uh, uh, look, if you just take West Hill by itself, it's a busy summer. But to have all of you come from other congregations, North Beaton, Grandview, and other places, that, that you would spend your time with us together and, and hopefully uh, to grow and, and be a, you know, appreciate your role as men in society, both today, tomorrow, uh, and into, into eternity. And to learn lessons uh, toward that is, is certainly a value. I know, uh, I think most people my age and older probably did not have things like this in the congregation when they grew up. And so to see this and to know that you already have a step ahead of, of where we started, uh, the leaders that you look to now, we think you, you uh, are going to be phenomenal leaders. And uh, you may think, well, hey, man, that's a big burden to put upon you. It's a big burden to put on every generation. But it takes men to rise to that occasion. I always think of, of Paul's closing in 1 Corinthians 16, uh, verses 13 and 14, when he says, Be strong in the Lord, and in the faith, and he says, quit ye like men. Equip yourselves to be spiritual men. Uh, do everything in love. What, what a great charge that is, to be men. And uh, too many people in our society are simply not doing it, but to see that you are willing to step up to that task is, is something great. I remember years ago as I was... Uh, it wasn't that long ago, I guess. But uh, I was taking classes at Texas A&M Commerce, and they were, they were communications classes. I think this particular one was an interpersonal communication. And, and in that class, there were several of us that were going through the same track, and so we saw each other. And uh, there were uh, two Justins in that class. And uh, to keep them straight, you know how you always give them nicknames and everything, at least in your own mind, uh, there was the good Justin and the bad Justin. And um, I remember one day I was having lunch with a good Justin, because like you say, you surround yourself with good people. And, and good Justin, he was a religious person, spiritually minded in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, he followed a, a, a denominational track and was part of that. But, but I remember eating lunch with him one day, and I asked him, I said, Justin, if, if, if I were not a Christian, if I, I didn't know anything about the Bible, and, and I came to you and I said, Justin, what must I do to be saved? Well, immediately your mind is going to Acts chapter 16 and verse 13, or verse 30, when the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? It's a great question. It's a question that each one of us ought to be asking for our own lives because ultimately we want that destination of heaven. And he said, well, I would take them to the Roman road. I said, oh, really? The Roman road? What, what's that? And he said, well, it, it starts in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, that, that's, that's good. Uh, and then he said, I would, I would take them to the next stop on the Roman road, which would be Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Once they see that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, I want them to see that the wage of sin is death, Romans six twenty three. That, that we, we are spiritually dead in our trespasses and sin. Uh, and be, because of that sin, we are dead before God. He makes it personal. And that, that's, that was a great point. He said, then, then I would take them to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, to show them how to overcome that sin. With, with the heart one believes, and with the mouth one confesses unto salvation. I said, well, that's, that's good. Is there anything else? He said, well, then I would, I would pray the sinner's prayer with him. I like the idea of being able to go to Romans and show from point to point how we, we move from, from that, that life of sinfulness all the way to that, that life in which heaven is our home. But I've got to tell you, that particular Roman road is a dead end. That particular Roman road that he gave to me doesn't go far enough. 
And it ends with what is commonly referred to as that sinner's prayer. But I've got to tell you, I wasn't surprised at all by Justin's answer. Most man-made religions today utilize the sinner's prayer in some form, a softened theology in itself that arose in the early 20th century. It's amazing. Uh, When you start asking, what must I do to be saved? How many people go to utilize that call upon the name of Jesus in the sinner's prayer and you'll be saved, which goes all the way back to about 1915? Well, what happened to all of those people from the time of the cross until 1915 or 1920 or so before the sinner's prayer was utilized. Was no one saved prior to the rise of the sinner's prayer? Doesn't that make us stop and think, where is its place in in history? It is a, a, a softened theology, meaning that it takes the theology of God the, the plan of God's salvation, which is grand and very specific and, and softens it down, knocks off rough corners that might offend someone or keep them from doing something that, that well, they don't really want to do, they feel uncomfortable with, and they, they, they package it down to a very small, popularized religious coding and, and popularized by men like Billy Graham and others in, in the mid-20th century. But with such a recent introduction, the sinner's prayer simply cannot reflect the teaching of the New Testament church. So when we're trying to identify the first century church in the 21st century, when we want to see the word or the church of the Bible created or recreated in our modern times, we can immediately eliminate any religion that utilizes the sinner's prayer. It's amazing how people will readily admit, well, the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. Well, if it's not in the Bible, why is it in your church? If it's not in the Bible, why didn't God use it? Is this some oral tradition passed down? No, this was something we as mankind made up. So any religion that utilizes it is obviously not the first century church. But that still leaves the question. What did the first century church teach about how to be saved? It isn't enough to know that, that well, the church didn't teach the, the sinner's prayer. We must know what did it teach. If we're going to restore New Testament Christianity today, we need to be able to answer that question, what must I do to be saved? And that's why I asked Justin that question that day. It's the the question that comes to us down through the ages, just as the jailer asked uh, Paul and and Silas that morning. And so this morning, what I want to do as we continue in this series on identifying the New Testament church, we turn our attentions to the plan of salvation, the very entrance into the church itself. It's amazing. People are so quickly modifying and adjusting and tweaking the, the, uh, uh, the plan of salvation to fit the needs of modern man when in reality God set the plan exactly like he wanted it and it's the same plan we had better be teaching today if we're going to continue to be the New Testament church. If we can't get this right, we can't even get in the church. With an honest study, I think God's plan of salvation emerges like like the tree from the fog. You look, and at first it's just fog, but the, the more you stare and the closer you get, the more the tree appears until finally it is clear, it is, it is uh, uh, easy to make out its features, and we know that that's, That's the tree. Well, it's just the same way with God. God has charted a course. And the more we look into the Word and disregard the fog of man-made religions and and things that are instituted later, uh, the more we see or more clearly we see and can declare with clarity the plan of salvation, God's plan of salvation. As with with any uh, journey that you're going to take, we always say a a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. But the destination of that journey 
For us, when we're talking about the spiritual destination, we're talking about heaven itself. Heaven is my destination. I want to be with God in person for eternity. Yes, I know that God's Spirit dwells in me even at this time, at this hour, but, but I want heaven. I want to be there with Him. That's my destination. And you may go up to a stranger and you say, you know, I'm looking to get to Tempe, Arizona. And so in your mind, you're asking, that's my destination. And he starts giving you all kinds of directions. Well, you need to turn left and go down this highway for a certain number of miles. Then you're going to make a right turn. Then you'll eventually veer back to the left. And you'll be on this highway. And you'll, get, and you'll eventually get to Tempe, Arizona. And we're going to assume for this moment that that man knows what he's talking about. And he's given us all the correct directions to get to Tempe, Arizona. But there's one other thing we need to know besides just the destination of where we want to go and how to get there. So we've got to know where we're starting. His directions may be fine to get me from Tilton, New Hampshire to Tempe, Arizona. That's not going to help me if I'm not stopping and starting in Tilton, New Hampshire, is it? I've got to know where I'm beginning. I'm where I'm starting. Sir, I need to get to Tempe, Arizona, and I'm, I'm starting in Corsicana, Texas. Oh, well, well, in that case, the directions are going to have to be different. If you have your Bibles, turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. We're going to see uh, uh, what to me is, is this beautiful picture that Paul paints of God's plan of salvation. And, and what it does is it, it begins with where we are now, it ends with the destination that we want, and it tells us how God has, has fulfilled his plan to get us there. It's the directions that we need to get there. Beginning in Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, we'll just read the paragraph here. He says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedience, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Look where Paul has us beginning, where we start. Summed up by the phrase, once fools. We ourselves were once foolish. We understand foolishness. We look back in our lives at times. Maybe we were little children or maybe when we were adolescents or young adults or maybe even just last week. We can look back over our lives and see foolish moments, can't we? Times of frivolity when we've done things that were just, when it was like we had lost our minds. We understand the concept of foolishness. But Paul is using this in a very narrowly focused way. His foolishness, he's talking about foolishness before God. That is to live in sin in front of God. We know Proverbs, or, or Psalm 14, one says, The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. But the application of that is the fool is the one who says in his heart or lives his life as if there is no accountability, that there is no God, there is nothing supernatural, there is no life beyond this life, and therefore I will live according to my passions and according to my pleasures. I will do exactly what I want to do, and I will not allow you to challenge me in any other way. That's why the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And there are many who, who claim there is a God. There is a God in heaven and he will judge us. But then live their lives in such a way that there's no God or that there are no consequences for our actions. The practical atheist we might call him. That's foolishness. 
And that life of practical atheism, that, that life before we give ourselves to God and allow him to control every step that we take, that's foolishness. We were once foolish, Paul says. All of us. Even you, Paul. Paul, the great apostle Paul was foolish, yes. Paul says, even I was foolish. Disobedient. We know what obedience is. It is to uh, do the things which are required or requested of us. As children, we learned when mom and dad said, take out the trash, obedience was taking out the trash. Disobedience would have been not taking it out. The same is true with God. When God has given us a list of things to do, things not to do in order to shine forth the light uh, light of Christ into our communities, we must be obedient. But Paul says there was a time where we were starting, we were foolish, we were disobedient, either because we didn't know what God wanted, we were ignorant of that, so we didn't obey, or because we saw what God wanted and we we started down that path, but we lost a zeal and a desire to obey and therefore became disobedient, or because when we looked at what God wanted, we said, I'm just not going to do that. And by outright refusal and denial, we have become disobedient. Paul said that's who we were. We were disobedient. We were led astray, Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 2, he says that you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of darkness. There's a train that has been going throughout the land for all of eternity, since since Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve ate that fruit. There's been a train in which the devil is leading the way. He is the conductor and the engineer, and his motor is, is powerful, and it seems like the fuel is an unending supply, and he continues to chug throughout the land. But there behind him is the world in tow, the world who who would rather follow the leading of Satan. In fact, the the Bible makes clear the distinction between the saint and the sinner, between those who are of the church and those who are in the world. He says the world, uh, uh, with all of its vices, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, 1 John 2 and verse 16. They're they're, they're the next car behind Satan himself as he chugs down the line of of evil and wickedness toward hell itself and he's blowing his whistles and the world has taken attention and they've latched on, baby, and they're, they're going with him as fast as he can take them with him. And Paul says, you were led astray. You had your cart hooked to the same train and were heading down the same slope to the eternity of hell itself. You were walking according to the course of the world who is being led by the nose by the devil himself. Where were you? You were in sin. Passing the days, he says, with malice and envy. And then he has this picture of As if malice and envy weren't bad enough, that's hate. But he says, and and you were hated by others. You were despicable, worthy. You lived your life in a way that was worthy to be hated. And in return, you hated others. It was a life of sin that itself was filled with hate. Hate. Which really, Paul is is setting up to be the foil against the contrast of God. God whose loving kindness has appeared. You see, your hate and the, the sin that surrounded your life, that sin is the backdrop of which God sent his son in loving kindness to take care of us. He says that you were slaves to passions and pleasures because sin becomes our taskmaster John 8 and verse 34 he is our master whom we submit ourselves to obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness Romans chapter 6 verses 16 through 19 Sin, the devil, the world is a a harsh taskmaster over us. That's where we start. And a lot of people don't like to think about where they're beginning, but every one of us 
those who have obeyed the gospel and are Christians and have, have unhitched their train from the devil's train and are trying to go to heaven, to, to, to those of us who, who are, are here this morning and have not obeyed the gospel and are still being led astray, we understand we all begin because of our sin. We're not starting in New Hampshire. We're starting in sin. We're not going to go into all that that entails other to know that that's spiritual death and to know that that is separation from our Creator. When Adam and Eve took that fruit and they took that first bite, that fellowship that they had with God and wherein God would walk in the garden with them and God would speak with them and God would tell them and instruct them all those things, when they ate that fruit, that fellowship was lost. Man fell away from his creator. And from that moment, God set in motion his plan of salvation, which would give man an avenue to come back to fellowship with God. But right here, right here we are still in sin. Here we are still separated from our creator. So now we look at the journey. Make that journey from, from the pit of sin to the presence of God. He saved us. That's, that's, if we, we learn nothing else, that's the phrase to focus on on this paragraph. He saved us. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared... The picture is as if, as if it were all darkness and, and, and there was no light, and then all of a sudden the, the light came on. All of a sudden everything appeared that we needed, and it was the grace of God, the love of God, the compassion and the mercy, the, the goodness and the loving kindness. And Paul uses that goodness and the loving kindness in, in direct contrast to the words malice and envy and hatred, which we see at the end of verse 3. Malice, envy, and hatred, that's man's way. That's the devil's way. But here we see the goodness and the loving kindness of God. That's God's way. And that's how he reaches out to us and gives us a beacon in the night. Light out of darkness. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. And enjoy salvation. It has appeared. He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. How foolish has mankind been down through the ages when salvation was looked upon not as obeying the gospel, not as relying upon the grace of God and the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but rather salvation was looked upon as, well, uh, uh, you've done uh, uh, six units of bad things, but if you can do seven units of good things, then, then that over outweighs the bad things and you can be saved. If, you're do if you've done some bad things in your life, do a bunch of good things in your life and that will overcome Brethren, if we just did one small sin, as we sometimes call them, and that's all that was on the bad side, and on the good side, we have a, a, a philanthropy and, and a humanitarianism. We've, we, have, we have helped people. We have given uh, to the poor. We have built homes for the homeless. We've, we, we've given to our own hurt. We've, we've loved, and, and, and we have shared, and we have taught, and all of that is on the other side. That's not enough to outweigh the sin that has caused us death and misery and separated us from God. Yeah. Not, Paul says, of works done in righteousness. We cannot do enough good works to overcome the sin which we have committed. We cannot get off the starting square. We are still in sin. But God saved us. How? According to his own mercy. It was by the mercy of God. It wasn't that Adam and Eve fell in the garden and Adam and Eve started saying, okay, how do we get back to God? Adam and Eve said what? How do we hide ourselves from God? They're building, or are they sewn together fig leaves to hide themselves from God? They're not seeking that fellowship because they are embarrassed and ashamed of their sins as we ought to be today. It was God 
who according to his own mercy saw that man fell and said, I want to renew that relationship with him. I want to restore that fellowship with mankind. But how did he do it? He says, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. We talk about the washing, and that's that word washing. Most all look at that as, as connection to baptism, and I believe that it is. That washing is the baptism. It, is, it encompasses our, our faith response to God's plan. God's plan was that, that I will send my son to die as a sacrifice for mankind's sin, that he might have an opportunity to be saved and reunited in fellowship with me. That's what I will do. That was God's plan of salvation. And man looks at that and says, I started in sin. I've fallen away from God. Now I want to come back to him. So in my, in my faith, my response is to submit to God's plan of salvation. The washing is baptism. It is a, baptism itself is that ritual which is required for salvation. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Baptism doth also now save us. But we know by implication that that washing in verse 5 has to include such things as faith because when the question was asked in Acts 16 and verse 13, what must I do? The first thing he was told, believe in the Lord Jesus with all your heart, with, with your whole household, you and your whole house. They believed and taking him that same hour, he washed their stripes and they were baptized. In that washing, in that faith response, it begins with faith, believing in Jesus Christ as the sacrifice of God for our sins. Jesus came to die so I could be saved. But it also requires repentance. For in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, when I ask the similar question, what must we do? And Peter's answer, repent. Repent, change your life, change your heart and your mind about sin. Sin is not just something, as an oh well situation. Oh well, I guess I'm in sin. Sin is a detriment to us. Identify sin for its danger. Identify sin that it is hitched to the devil's train and it is, it is chugging toward hell every single day. Repentance is saying, I don't want to be part of that train anymore. I don't want to be headed to hell. I, I understand that sin is a detriment to me. And unhook. In Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, there is a confession that must be made with the mouth towards salvation. But the plan of salvation isn't over at faith. It isn't over at repentance. It isn't over at that confession. The plan of salvation culminates in baptism. These actions, though, we understand are not the power of our salvation. These actions do not save us, but let me tell you, without them, we'd be lost. The power of the salvation isn't because I believe. The power of the salvation isn't because I've repented or confessed or was baptized. Those are, the, the, those are our faith response. The power of our salvation is still from heaven, from God himself. Because he says it is by the washing, now get this, of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. When we respond in the washing of baptism, which is the ritual, the regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit comes. That is the reality of what is happening behind the ritual. We, we, we say it all the time. The waters of baptism themselves are not magical. The power is not in the water. Well, where is the power? The power is in God who at the baptism sends his Holy Spirit into us, who, number one, regenerates, which means to start the life going again. We know what a generator is. When the power goes out, the power is off. You turn the generator on or start the generator up, and it gives power again. 
Whenever we sin, we have shut the power of God off from our life. When we come to him in faith response, he regenerates us. Life and renewal. Not only does the Holy Spirit come to us and regenerate the life behind the scenes of that ritual of baptism is the reality of his coming, but it is also the beginning of the process of sanctification, renewal. To renew day by day by day. Though the outward man decays, Paul says, the inward man is renewed day by day by day. It is a process. Renewal isn't a a one-time momentary act. Renewal is when we live by the Holy Spirit, by the power of God, by the instruction of His Word, that each day we are made new again. We are sanctified and drawn closer and closer to God. The washing of regeneration of the, of the Holy Spirit. This same Holy Spirit, he says, whom he has he is poured out upon us. All of this squares, of course, with Jesus' statement in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, but especially verse 5, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Born of the water is baptism, and the Spirit is the Spirit's coming, the regeneration and renewal, the reality behind the ritual that comes to us. Except we do those things, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And it is poured out richly in overabundance through Jesus Christ. This is God's plan for us. That, that the journey is going to, to lead us unto heaven itself because he has richly blessed us. It's the salvation that we know. And what it shows us is the great length to which God will go to save me. A wretched, blind, miserable naked man like me, bare before God, worthless as as anything else, that God would go through such great lengths as to sacrifice his own son to lift me out of my squalor. I then stand justified by grace. To be sure our salvation is a gift from God, it is not the result of works done in righteousness. I have traveled that road And at the end, there is a destination. The blessed destination is devoted to God, devoted to the good works. Verse 8 says the saying uh, is trustworthy. You you can take it to the bank. And I I want you to insist on these things, Titus. I want you to insist that the brethren there, the church, understands these things. That you are in sin, foolish, led astray, and all of those things. That God has done all of these things to save you based upon your faith response to him. God has saved you. Now, how do you live? Those whom have believed, that's us. If you are a child of God, you are one who has believed And Paul is insisting on you as one who has believed that you may be careful to devote ourselves to good works. To give our lives wholly in assisting God in his compassion and love and mercy. Not only reaching out to those who are lost, but reaching out to those who are are impoverished. Uh, Reaching out to one another as the church to build it up and strengthen it. We're, We're challenging these young men to become leaders in the church. Not just to be a leader, but to strengthen the church to make it better. Because your presence in the church has been required. The process of that renewal, that sanctification begins at baptism, at the washing. But it continues through our continued faithful response to him, devoted to good works. And again, we emphasize those works do not save us, but without them we'd be lost. To follow the directions and to get to the correct destination, we must know where we start. We begin in sin. We may not have wasted the family inheritance and riotous living We may not become axe murderers and slaughter people throughout the land. But grading sins, that's a human invention. That's something that man has done. That one lie long ago, 
that moment of jealousy that you had or envy, that moment of greed or hatred, even if stifled quickly in the moment, is the sin that will take you to hell. It is the sin that will bring spiritual death. It is the sin that will separate you from God. It's not about a big sin or a little sin. It's about recognizing sin as the product of our foolishness destroys us completely, entirely. There's no middle ground. There's not almost lost. There's lost because of sin. And we follow then God's directions. And while the Romans Road is popular among evangelicals, uh, it's a noble beginning. But look, if you're not going to follow the full plan of salvation, uh, no matter how noble it is, it comes back to sin. Because you don't get out of sin following the false way. Man-made ways of salvation, the sinner's prayer, those things that man has come up with, they simply lead back to sin. And they don't lead to heaven. And so we must be washed in the waters of baptism so that God can regenerate us and begin renewing us daily. Only by faith response can we be saved. Only by recognizing God's plan of salvation. It is a mark of the authentic New Testament church. Any church that does not teach this today is not the New Testament church. But... On the other side of that, it is also a mark of an authentic Christian that I, I have believed in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and that I have unhitched my, tra my, my cart from the, the devil's train and I have hitched onto Christ the only way unto heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I have repented of that life of sin and I'm confessing him as the Son of God this morning. Jesus Christ is the Son of God and if making that confession, you are ready to give yourself to him in baptism in full allegiance, devoted unto good works, so that at baptism, that washing, God may regenerate you and renew your, uh, uh, start your renewal today, then this morning you have an opportunity to make sure that this plan of salvation is not just the mark of the New Testament church or the authentic Christian, but that it is the mark of your life, trusting that God will save by grace if you will respond in faith this morning. If you're ready to make that faithful step, won't you come down these aisles? Why don't you come to submit yourself to him and be baptized for the remission of your sins while we stand and while we sing? And you been to Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood?